Hey everyone, in this video, I wanted to talk about the different levels at large tech companies and explain to you the different roles and responsibilities that you have at different levels and also give you some tips to help you navigate from level to level throughout your career. And so that's what this video is about. So what I wanted to do is first just start off with a level comparison of some of the different tech companies that we have. So Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, these are the classic fang companies. Uh, and this chart, this is from the website levels.fm. FYI, which is very, very handy, by the way. It's usually for like salary comparisons. And, and you'll see once I get into that, uh, how they deviate from different levels to levels here. Um, but it's handy to see how the different levels compare to one another across these different companies. And so you can easily add like more filters here to do this. This isn't like sponsor or anything. I just use this website and some people use it a lot as well, especially when you're looking for a new job. So in terms of career experience for each of these different levels, SD1 or L4 is usually like a new hire, uh, usually straight out of college. Uh, L5 or SD2 is usually, I want to say, like between uh, two to five years of experience. Uh, L6 or SD3 is usually between five and 10. And then these other ones here are like 10 plus years of experience. Uh, but in terms of how the pay deviates, you can kind of see it um, between the different companies. But like at Amazon, for example, if you click on this, you can see it's like 242 approximately, which is like a pretty crazy number if you think like this is a college hire. And this is, I believe in, yeah, it's in Canadian dollars. This is a little bit deceptive because um, the filter here doesn't really account for location. So it's showing Canadian dollars as if you worked in Seattle, which is where like the headquarters is. Uh, so these aren't really accurate. You'd have to add in the location based filters as well, uh, which should be like an option somewhere up here if you uh, kind of play with this tool. Uh, anyway, so around 250 for SD1, then you're looking at like 382 for these guys. And then SD3 is like quite a bit higher. And this kind of scales up as you go. Uh, if you look at the different companies, they're not that different. Google, for example, it's around the same 250 for a more junior engineer and then L4 or um, at Google is 381. Uh, and then senior is, yeah, so 531 for senior at Google and SD3 at Amazon is pretty much the same thing. With a lot of these companies have had some pretty crazy stock rises recently too. Uh, so these numbers are probably pretty inflated. Anyways, what I want to do now is like now that you have an understanding of generally like what these levels mean, I want to walk you through the different roles and responsibilities. Now I'm going to talk about Amazon because I have the most experience here because I work there. Um, but talking to a bunch of friends that work at a bunch of these different companies, it's pretty much the same. Uh, so let's talk about junior developers, which are uh, kind of like college hires. So they would be right here. Uh, and these folks are usually like new hires. So they're like brand new, uh, usually have like a college degree. And typically how I've seen folks get into these companies is usually through like a student program where the university or college has a program with the university. And so they set up like interns and interns end up turning into uh, student hires. That didn't happen with me, but the company has changed recently. So so maybe that's the only way to get in. I know there are ways to apply um, if you are a student or looking to graduate to get in as an SD1 at Amazon. Um, but you have to kind of just have a resume and it's not through a university or any kind of body that can, can help you. Anyways, what are the responsibilities for an SD1? Um, so for responsibilities, it's mostly things that are given to you, right? Like you're not going to be designing any big system or any big feature, or any big component. Um, you're going to be given usually very clear, simple tasks, sometimes with a little bit of ambiguity. Okay. And the expectation is for you to use resources, to use internal websites and, you know, use your problem solving skills, if not build some, some new problem solving skills as you take on new tasks, but to essentially be given a pretty clear problem and be able to figure out how to solve it and then implement the solution, okay? Of course, you're a new hire, so it's not expected that you know everything, especially about like the internal tooling at a company. Uh, so it's it's expected that you're gonna ask for help, okay? Usually you'll be paired with an onboarding buddy that'll help you understand like how the systems work and like what's the role of the team, what does the uh, team, like how does it fit into other components or other teams that are also within your org? So that's generally what the SD1 does. Uh, primarily, you're gonna be doing coding that's going to be the majority of your work i'd say like 80 percent of your time should be coding um, of course you are learning a bunch of new things as you go so a lot of your early time will be just like figuring things out uh, i know personally it took a long time when i first started as an sde um, to 
feel like I was effective. Uh, it took about six months to learn all the internal tools and all the different things and different ways of doing things. I'd worked at a startup previously, which was a completely different way of thinking. And so when I first came in, I was like, what is all this stuff? Like, how does these things work? Had to learn AWS, coding practices, all the internal tools. It was a lot. Uh, they call it drinking from a fire hose, which is pretty accurate. Uh, you're pretty much learning constantly. Um, so that's kind of like what an SD1 does. Now to get to the next level, uh, so SD1 to SD2, what you're going to want to start doing is um, you're going to want like to have some kind of like feature project, right? Where you're designing and implementing a, a simple feature within the team, okay? And so you should put out some kind of design document that explains like, here's the feature, here's what we're doing. Of course, you gotta work with your manager to ensure that they give you this project. You can't just kind of create this out of thin air. Um, but that's kind of gonna kind of be one big exit criteria going from SD1 to SD2. It's gonna be some kind of uh, design plus implementation project, usually fairly simple. It's usually just a feature of an existing service or product that you already have. You're not creating something brand new, like a brand new service, brand new architecture here. It's usually pretty straightforward. So that's gonna be primarily like the big milestone to get you from SDU one to two. Of course, there's all these other things that you have to do in between, which is like, you know, you gotta be growing your peers, you gotta be having good code quality, you got to have like attention to detail and kind of be right and not like be giving BS answers or wrong answers. There's a lot of things that happen in between, um, but that's going to kind of come with time. And as you figure things out and get more comfortable, you're going to kind of advance into the next stage, which is the SDE2. And let me just make sure I don't have anything that I forgot here. Yeah, mostly clear tasks. Okay. Um, all right, now we are in, let's actually just get rid of some of these. Now we are here, right? So we are SD2. Usually this, I would say, is like two, two to five years of experience, maybe three to five years of experience, depending on how you look at it. And SD2s, at least at Amazon, are like the workhorses of the company. They're the ones that like do the most work, believe it or not. And when I say do the most work, I mean the implementation work, not necessarily like the, the higher level thinking that's happening at like these levels here. Um, but the SD2 is the one that really like does a lot and puts out tons and tons of code. I would say you're probably looking at a balance here of like 70-30, 70, uh, 70 being the amount of time you're coding and 30% everything else. Uh, but that's just, you know, this isn't scientific. This is just a feeling here. Now, some of the roles and responsibilities that you'll have as an SD2, uh, you're meant to really understand what the systems that you own are and how they work, like the, the low level details. So you should have a good understanding of what these systems do, be able to debug issues like complex issues by like going through logs and figuring out like how is this data all connected? How did this thing work? Why did this happen this certain way? Um, you're going to be spending a lot of time um, with your internal services to really understand the ins and outs of how they all work. Um, and you're also going to be doing a lot more things in terms of mentorship as well. So mentoring new SDEs that are joining either the company or your team. So you're going to be spending a lot of time there. You're also going to be doing uh, learning sessions or knowledge transfer sessions to help your peers understand um, how your systems work and how they operate in order to create a more effective team. Uh, again, like being a good contributor and advancing your career is a lot about um, not just hoping, not just worrying about yourself, but also helping the people around you, creating a good team. Um, so you, you shouldn't just be focused on an individual, your individual self here, uh, and in any of these levels, especially as you go through the senior and, and principal paths. Um, but you should be more focused on how do I improve myself and those that are around me so we can create a high performing team. So that's the primary role of the SDE2. You will be given tasks occasionally that stretch beyond like simple features. Um, you could be involved in like a new um, feature that's going to be across different teams now. And maybe you'll be collaborating with some peers on other teams. Some more experienced SDE2s may get more design tasks that are going to stretch beyond and start touching other teams. And that's a general trend actually as you kind to go down this scale here um, the level of involvement your day-to-day -day activities will have with other teams that are external to just your own is going to constantly increase right so uh, that's something to keep in mind if you're not um, someone that looks to that enjoys kind of collaborating with others other teams or other peers that are in different spaces then uh, maybe just kind of want you want to stay at this level um, but assuming that you don't want to stay at this level assume that you want to get to sd3 uh, what do you have to do there? So now you want to 
go from SD two to three? What does that problem look like? Um, you know, in addition to everything I just said in terms of the core responsibilities, the usual thing to get you from two to three is some kind of like bigger project that's going to stretch beyond um, just your team and start touching like a bunch of other teams, usually like adjacent teams. So if you imagine like your team is right here, um, usually you have like a couple partner teams that are over on the side here. Uh, maybe you have another one over here. And so what you'll do is like you'll have like some kind of project that's going to be touching these guys' systems, uh, touching these guys' systems. And usually it's something with like a lot of business value or it could be something that's more architectural and strategic. Uh, but essentially you're going to be touching this guy's stuff and this guy's stuff, not necessarily like implementing code there, but influencing it. So you're going to have to know like how does this thing work? How does this thing work? How is my system going to connect with this and that? What kind of changes are they going to need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you're going to have to do like some kind of design and implementation feature that's going to span across multiple different teams here. And that's going to be like your your big capstone project that kind of starts to push you into the next level which is the sde3 level and sometimes it takes a couple of these projects to really like help demonstrate that you have the necessary skills uh, but that's kind of how you go from two to three another critical thing and this applies for all levels again as you kind of go from um SD2 and, and downwards is um, really working with your managers so that th you, can, you can help give them additional insight into some of the problems that the system or the team is facing at any given time. Since I transitioned to a manager, this became abundantly clear. Like I don't have time to look at the details anymore of the code, right? So like I'm not in the weeds, like boots on the ground anymore. What I have to do is rely on my teammates to help raise issues or rely on my SDEs to, to identify pro potential problems and raise them to me if they feel that, you know, there's something worth talking about so that we can prioritize and plan for, you know, projects or tasks that are going to address them. Uh, so that's a, a critical thing that you should start doing like you probably won't be able to do that as an SD1. You're going to start doing that as an SD2 for sure. And then as an SD3, it's not going to apply as much because you're starting to kind of step back a little bit and work more on architectural things and not necessarily in the day to day. Um, so as an SD2, keep an eye out for like ticking time bombs or problems or potential things that you think need to be addressed in the uh, upcoming future and raise them to your manager. That's going to help you build trust with them, help you uh, kind of establish your rapport so that they understand that you know you're you actually care about the system and you're prioritizing the right things that are important for the team so that's something that you can do uh, to quickly score some brownie points but anyways uh like i said the big the big deliverable is like this capstone project from sd2 and that's going to kind of hopefully get you into sd3 okay so now let's talk about like what are the sd3 responsibilities this one um is starting like the further you go down this charts the more broader your role Role should become right so you're not necessarily just focusing on like the adjacent teams like we were talking about before uh, you're going to be focusing on like much further away potentially much further away uh, starting to cross the lines of different orgs potentially however that's more like the principal role at least at amazon so you, the level of abstraction starts to rise uh, you start thinking more about like the business problems and uh, how are we going to address them another big thing that you'll start doing from an sd3 perspective in addition to like growing your peers which is a big part of it is um start to be like you'll be given business problems okay like we have a problem with the way we operate and it's like a business focused thing right maybe a metric is like suffering or there's a bad user experience or we have a bad process to do this particular thing from an operations perspective uh, if you have a good manager they'll give you a problem like this and be like i need you to figure out like what's going on here and how do we fix it super ambiguous right like very scary uh gonna put you in outside of your comfort zone for sure if you've never been faced with one of these types of tasks and the expectation is for you to like get out there talk to operations people talk to people producing the metrics or, like look at the data and understand what is actually happening who is doing what and then synthesize all that information, be able to explain it to your leadership. Um, so not necessarily the most technical language, but more kind of business language, um, more problem oriented. So you're explaining like, what is the general problem here and how are we gonna tackle it? And then be able to communicate a vision, right? Like here's how we should solve it. Here are the different components that we need that we don't have right now that we should build out that'll help solve this critical business problem. And here are the entitlements. Here's the amount of money that we could potentially save by doing this. Um, so you can see like it, it's a little bit 
um, wide here. There's a lot of responsibility built into these roles. And this just gets like worse over time, right? So the, the further you go up past SD3, the broader and broader and broader this will get. Um, so being able to communicate or being able to, to dive deep into these different problem areas uh, to figure out like what's actually going on. You need to have some really good problem solving skills, not necessarily scared of ambiguity, although I promise you it gets better over time. Everyone is a little bit scared, but it's totally fine. Uh, and also be able to write for a, um, a leadership audience. So you need to write, be able to write technical documents, also be able to write like not necessarily technical documents, but like business documents that cross the lines between business and tech to explain like what the problem is and how we're going to solve it with technology. And you need to be able to write these like visionary things of like, here's how we're going to do it. You need to be able to convince your team that like, this is the right direction. This is what we should be working on, how we should be thinking about problems. You can tell there's a lot of responsibility for this role. I spent many years as an SD3. I actually stopped uh, like my career, like right here as I was like kind of getting ready for the jump to the next level to principal. Uh, and since then I became a manager, which has been very helpful because I've been able to see from a different perspective on like, what are the expectations for each of these roles and what do I expect of my SDEs uh, and SDEs on other teams, but it's been very, very helpful. Uh, unfortunately, I can't talk too much about getting to principal or being principal. Rather, I can talk about getting to it. Uh, and it's kind of what I already discussed, right? Being given a, a vague uh, business problem, being able to navigate it, figure it out, uh, and then propose a solution and then hopefully drive the solution too. Don't just like propose things and let them fall, uh, but be able to actually push them forward so that um, the right teams are, are contributing. Um, and also as well, as you continue to go down, particularly as an SD3 in principle, a lot of focus gets placed on um, kind of growing your team or not necessarily your team anymore, but they call it being a force multiplier. So what are the things that you do that can disproportionately improve the lives of other engineers or other people around you, right? Maybe that means like building a library that's going to solve this recurring problem. Maybe it means doing like knowledge transfer sessions or presentations at a conference or writing a paper that's going to be used and accepted by some journal that's going to have some impact. But basically, things that you do that can multiply yourself so that you can kind of have multiple, like 10 different arms in different areas, right? Um, that's a big expectation when you're an SD3 and above is like growing all the people around you. So like I said, never actually got to principal, but I do know quite a few and I, I know some principal, uh, senior principals as well. Uh, and from what I can tell, their lives are just increasingly um, dealing with abstractions and looking thing, looking at things more strategically. You need, do need to kind of embrace those skills that you developed at the different levels though, like SD2 uh, and one and like be able to get into the weeds when necessary. Uh, although these these types of folks do spend a lot of time more so in like document writing and being more of a consultant. It's like, what should we do here? How should we tackle this problem? What should our strategy be? Um, so yeah, that is a breakdown of the different levels um, here, at least at, at Amazon and some other companies that use a similar structure. Uh, I hope this gives you some visibility into what the different expectations are and hopefully set you up so that, you know, you can start figuring out how do I advance my career. I encourage you all to like be very transparent with your manager. If you have a good manager, you should be having like a career session every six months or so that say like, here's where I am and here's what I need to do to get the next next level and just make sure that you're communicating your aspirations because honestly a lot of what matters is that you know you have aspirations of wanting to grow and then being able to show through your day to day that you know you're trying to improve yourself and trying to improve everyone around you if you can show those skills then it becomes an easy decision to kind of give you increasing responsibility and help push you forward in terms of your career uh, so that's my advice for you if you have any questions or comments please leave them below in the description and please don't forget to like and subscribe i'll see you next time